Welcome to Weapons and Warfare from Straight Arrow News. I'm your host, Ryan Robertson, and we've got another great show for you this week, getting our geek on just a bit. Just ahead in our debrief, a look at some sweeping changes the Air and Space Forces are making to stay ready, willing, and able in the face of constantly evolving threats from all parts of the world. Plus, a breakdown of the mutant missile from the Air Force Research Laboratory in our Weapon of the Week. In comms check, we're talking about refurbishing weapons and some duplicitous diplomacy, plus my thoughts on the fall of Avdivka in eastern Ukraine ahead in the wrap. But first, some headlines you may have missed. For all of the aid Ukraine has received from its fight against Russia's illegal invasion, perhaps no contribution has been as anticipated as 19 American-made F-16s from Denmark the first of which will arrive in Ukraine sometime this summer, most likely June. That word coming from the Danish defense minister last week, who told reporters the war in Ukraine is entering its third year, and so continued military support for Ukraine is completely decisive for the outcome of the war. The F-16s are in addition to an aid package worth more than $246 million from Denmark, while Congress continues to drag its heels in Washington in providing more much-needed assistance, the American military is doing what it can by providing air and ground training for Ukrainian troops that will fly and maintain the donated fighter jets. The Navy can now count a new ship in its arsenal. On February 17th, the USS John L. Canley was officially commissioned. The Polar-class Expeditionary Mobile Base is the fourth of its kind, and the first to be named after a Medal of Honor winner. The ship's first captain spoke during the commissioning ceremony at Naval Air Station North Island. Y'all have just brought this ship to life. That's not just a metaphor to me. Her body is well and strongly built of American steel right here in San Diego. Her spirit lived upon this earth for 83 years before her first plank was laid, imbued with honor, courage, and selfless sacrifice by her namesake. The 784-foot ship will be able to deploy troops and equipment in areas where the U.S. doesn't have easy access to land or ports. To the Red Sea now, where after having countless numbers of their missiles and drones taken out, the Pentagon is confirming the Houthis successfully downed an American drone. And on February 19th, a U.S. MQ-9 was downed uh, or went down off the coast of Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen uh, in the Red Sea. Initial indications are that it was shot down by a Houthi surface-to-air missile. In terms of um, recovery options, I know CENTCOM is looking into that, um, but I don't believe it has been recovered at this time. At least not recovered by the U.S. Video clips making the rounds on the social media site formerly known as Twitter show parts and pieces of what appear to be a Reaper drone. There are also clips claiming to have caught the shoot down on camera. Still, according to the Pentagon, the U.S. has been able to interrupt at least two more deliveries of weapons intended for the Houthis in early February, as well as 32 strikes on Houthi-held positions. One of the things you notice first at an event like the Warfare Symposium is a collection of buzzwords, acronyms, and well-crafted phrases. But distilled down, this year's message was pretty simple. Change is coming. For the uninitiated, the bright lights and big displays on the exposition floor can easily steal your attention away from the real story of this year's gathering. Unveiled in the opening hours were 24 new priorities for Air and Space Force leadership. The goal is to become more nimble forces that lean on the teamwork established at home bases. That's what this is about. That's taking this Air Force that has the best talent, the best teamwork, and re-optimizing it to be able to dominate in this game the way it's going to be played now and into the future. That's what this is about. One of the most obvious changes will be how combat wings are formed. Gone will be the traditional air expeditionary wings. In their place, deployable combat wings in place combat wings, and combat generation wings. The goal is to put together units that have everything they need to take the fight to the enemy, rather than the traditional method of piecing together various units from all over the world. We can no longer afford to move slowly, and if you want to move fast and coherently, you have to be in unison, you have to be integrated. General Alvin did not provide a timetable for force-wide implementation of this concept, 
Previously scheduled testings at three different bases this summer were already suspended. While the total number of changes announced and their impact are too numerous to fully recount here, they fall into four categories. Develop people, generate readiness, project power, and develop capabilities. I am unapologetic to stand here in front of you and say I do not know the exact final destination, and here's why. Because if we wait to move to have those final answers, we will be too late. While sweeping changes for the 76-year-old Air Force certainly makes sense, the four-year-old Space Force is not sitting idle. It too will take part in the two dozen priorities outlined at the symposium. One of the headline changes is the creation of a new field command. So we are going to establish a Space Futures Command that is combined of three centers that starts to ask these fundamental questions that puts together a force that we can offer to combatant commanders that doesn't just have the systems, it has the tactics, the training, the operational concepts. While both leaders emphasized change is rarely easy, General Saltzman made the point of framing these shifts in priorities as an opportunity for Space Force Guardians to shape the future of their growing service branch. I challenge all of you to jump on board. We get to re-optimize for space. It's not that we must re-optimize for space, we know, or for a great power competition, we know that. We get to re-optimize. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. With the opportunity comes a lot of motivating factors, the biggest of which are playing out on the battlefields of Ukraine, in the shipping lanes of the Red Sea, and China's stated intentions to reunify with Taiwan, by force if necessary. You know, we're in a sprint to get better and improve our readiness posture, but we're also in a marathon to stay competitive over time. Uh, we, we got a lot of hard work to do. Uh, this is the most difficult, uh, uh, intense, uh, focused threat that I've ever seen us face. And we're just going to have to respond accordingly. For a full accounting of all the changes on tap for both the Air and Space Forces, go ahead and just hit the links below. When you hear the term mutant, you might think of a classic Hollywood B-movie, or maybe my favorite Heroes in a Half Shell, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. But the Air Force Research Lab, or AFRL, wants to add a new definition to your mental Rolodex. Meet the mutant missile. On the surface, it looks like most any other missile, but you don't get the mutant moniker unless there's something a little different at work. That would be the Articulation Control Actuation System. To put it in layman's terms, the head and fins of the missile can move to meet the target. The inspiration for this application actually came from another aerial aficionado. They noticed a really interesting thing when these falcons would intercept their prey. As the head moved, the tail would move. And there seemed to be a cause and effect relationship between head movement and tail movement. Apart from that, there's a target tracking, the target detection function of the head. And so this got us thinking because falcons have the same objectives as missiles and interceptors. Get the target and capture it. Properly inspired, the AFRL engineers set about turning an idea into a reality. The missile on display at the recent AFA Warfare Symposium is the end result of years of work. The MUTANT, which is an acronym for Missile Utility Transformation via Articulated Nose Technology, is a weapon that can adjust for slight misses while in flight, helping to ensure when a punch is thrown, it hits the target, whatever that may be. As for how that punch is thrown, well, the engineers are still working on it. We're exploring a, a broad target set. We're looking at offensive roles, we're looking at defensive roles, we're looking at surface launch functions. Uh, all of these kind of go into our figuring about the future instance of a system that may employ this technology to provide overall operational value to the warfighter. The mutant is set for testing later this year with the Hellfire missile. As for when it might be ready for use in the real world, that, as they say, is TBD. 
Hey folks, it's time for Comps Check once again. It's one of my favorite parts of the show. It's our opportunity to kind of gauge where your mind is at. We peruse our social media channels, uh, look at your comments, your questions, and try to answer them here. It's also an opportunity for us to update you on previous reporting um, when those uh, nuggets don't really fit anywhere else in the show. So let's go ahead and get started. The first comms check comes to us from a story that we had done a few weeks ago about the U.S. Army refurbishing about 2,000 Stinger missiles. Uh, the refurbishment is to upgrade them. Um, these, these missiles were... Uh, marked for disposal, uh, but the Army is refurbishing them, bringing them back up to, um, up to snuff, so to speak, and actually uh, giving them some improvements as well. Now, the Army had sent some Stinger missiles to Ukraine previously, which I assume is the basis for this comment from Robert N. Agle. It's probably Robert N. Agle. But it could be Robert in Eagle. We don't know. I've never met the guy. Uh, but Robert is uh, saying that's what happens when you give all your munitions to lost causes. Um, I think the implication here, and like I said, I've never met him, but I think the implication here is the U.S. is forced to kind of go into the uh, pile of, of misfit weapons, uh, so to speak, to find things that we could still um, use to defend ourselves against uh, our enemies because we've given so much to Ukraine. Um, to kind of put things into perspective, the you know the U.S. has sent billions of dollars in weapons and aid to Ukraine, but that is a very small percentage of our overall uh, budget, uh, defense budget. So rest assured, Robert, the U.S. has plenty of weapons lying around, uh, and actually most of what we've sent over to Ukraine has kind of been hand-me-down weapons. Um, but to get back more to the point of the Stinger missiles, the the exercise to refurbish the Stinger missiles didn't start. Uh, once Russia invaded Ukraine. It actually started um, about five years before the initial uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, in 2017 is when the Army started the refurbishing of these Stinger missiles. Uh, and also, uh, Robert, it might be good to point out that by refurbishing these Stinger missiles, we're actually saving about $50,000 a pop uh, because once these missiles, once any weapon really that explodes, that goes boom, um, lives past its shelf life, it's marked for disposal, and that costs money to dispose of those things properly. So by extending the shelf life, uh, the U.S. tax dollar is actually saving uh, some money. Oh, and by the way, the Stinger missiles, which is, you know, 1970s, 80s technology, uh, they were not made to handle these uh, smaller, slower-moving, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, or drones that we're seeing pop up all over uh, the skies, over battlefields. But now with these new upgrades, the Stinger missiles can take those out. So uh, really, any way you look at it, it's, uh, it's a good deal for the DOD. It's a good deal for the American taxpayer. And it's a good deal for us, potentially, uh, if folks try to fly these UAVs in American airspace, uh, God forbid, and we need these Stinger missiles. So ho hopefully, Bob, that kind of clears things up for you. Uh, and we can go ahead and move on to our next comms check, which comes to us from a story that we had done. This is actually... This comps check is an update to an update. So the original story was about Venezuela, uh, the president there, Nicolas Maduro, wanting to uh, potentially invade Guyana. Uh, Guyana is in control of an area called Essequibo, or Essequibo, or Esquibo. It's, there's multiple pronunciations. I always get hammered in the comment section whenever I say it. Uh, but Nicolas Maduro said he wanted to invade and take over that area because it's rich in oil and other uh, mineral deposits. Well, that prompted a response from Guyana's allies, uh, chief among them the United States. Uh, Chile, or, excuse me, China also has an interest uh, in Guyana. But the U.S. Uh, kind of came to Guyana's aid and said, whoa, 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 slow your roll, Nicolas Maduro. We're not down with that. Uh, and to which Maduro uh, kind of seemed to come to his, uh, you know, uh, the, the light dawned in his head, if you will, and he decided not to invade Guyana. They shook hands um, and said, released a statement, and that was our, our update to the original story, was the fact that Guyana and Venezuela were now friends, potentially. But you know, the thing about dictators, and Nicolas Maduro is absolutely a dictator, they don't necessarily keep to their word. So the Reuters headline that you see here is from the end of 2024, uh, you know, December-ish. U.S. expresses support for Guyana's sovereignty amid border transitions with Venezuela. So that's when the U.S. was like, back off, Maduro. 
Uh, but Maduro changed his mind. So fast forward to early February, you have this headline from the AP. The U.S. is increasing its urgent military aid to Guyana as neighboring Venezuela's threats linger. And linger is really the perfect descriptor adjective here uh, because the threats never really w went away. We, th we thought they were dealt with, but it always kind of in the back of our minds. Uh, Maduro is a dictator. He might try to invade. He did. Um, well, excuse me, he did not invade, but he is uh, appears to be planning to do so. So the United States is sending as much military might, all the weaponry that really the DOD can spare right now in the region, to Guyana to try to act as a deterrence against Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela from invading. However, it's not as if Venezuela has been sitting on their hands. Uh, this satellite image is from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and it shows a river, excuse me, a river crossing on the border of Guyana on this side and Venezuela on that side. This picture originally was October 27, 2023. And you can see the river crossing here. It's kind of crude. There's a dirt road. There's a small checkpoint, a couple of storage buildings, um, a very crude uh, boat ramp that you can kind of see here with a small, small little port ferry kind of thing kind of tied up to the end of the boat ramp. Uh, not, not a whole lot of infrastructure here in October of 2023. However, if you fast forward to the same river crossing in January of 2024, it is blatantly obvious that a whole lot of work has been done here. Uh, some high grade uh, industrial level um, grading has been done from the road to, to the river in two different areas. The original uh, river access has been expanded. There's actually um, some armored personnel carriers that the satellite is picking up uh, parked along here. Uh, there's some construction materials set aside for potentially more projects that uh, Venezuela has planned on the Guyanese side of the border. Um, and then in the, the other new addition, the new boat access, river access point, you can see a uh, pretty, pretty wide grade here. Oops, uh, pretty wide grade here. And also uh, this is a heavy, uh, it's the jungle, it's the you know, rain, rainforest of the world. So this area is, is heavily uh, jungled, a lot of vegetation here. Some of that's been cleared to create space for a staging area, for more military equipment. We don't really know at this point. So the update to the update to the original story is Nicolas Maduro has gone back on his word and appears to be staging a possible military incursion from Venezuela to Guyana. How is this going to play out? Is this just more posturing or is there actually going to be troops that cross the river border? We don't know. I'm sure in another month or so, there will be an update to the update to the update to the original story. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. To end the show this week, folks, I want to talk a little about Avdivka, a small Ukrainian town that used to be home to about 30,000 people. That's about the size of Kearney, Nebraska, or about twice the size of Martha's Vineyard. Avdivka, or what was left of it, fell this past week to Russia. The town had seen almost a decade of fighting. When Russian-backed separatists created the Donetsk People's Republic, Avdivka was within those made-up boundaries and was a frontline city during the early days of fighting in the Donbass back in 2017. Avdivka fell because Ukraine did not have the resources anymore to defend it. Russia lost tens of thousands of troops taking the city, just like Bakhmut, but they took the city, just like Bakhmut. If anything, Avdivka proves Putin and his commanders are willing to do almost anything to achieve their goals, whatever the cost. Avdivka, Bakhmut, and the entire war, really, are an example of what happens when promises of protection are broken. You see, when the Soviet Union fell, Ukraine had nuclear weapons, weapons which could have been used as a deterrent against future attacks. But under a 1994 agreement called the Budapest Memorandum, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons with the promise that the US, the UK, and Russia would guarantee the country's safety. Now, I'm not so naive to think a nuclear-armed Ukraine in the 90s and early 2000s would have been a great idea. But I would hope when countries like the U.S. and U.K., which pride themselves on maintaining the moral high ground, make a promise to defend you, that they would follow through. Yes, the Americans sent billions in aid to Ukraine, 
but aside from some select systems, most of what we sent Ukraine was older, outdated equipment. We literally pieced together an air defense system with parts we had lying around, called it a Frankensam, and sent it overseas. Is that coming to the defense of Ukraine? Keeping our word as a nation matters, and it's not just about a sense of honor, but for the safety of our nation. In the Pacific, the U.S. is going to need the help of partner nations to stop Chinese aggression if Beijing moves on Taiwan, or tries to hamper trade in the South China Sea, or tries to take over the Arctic, which is also a concern. Personally, I hope Japan and Australia and all of our allies and partners across the world can keep their promises to the U.S. better than the U.S. is keeping its promise to Ukraine. So that's my wrap, and that's the show. Hopefully you learned something today. Of course, please remember, if you want to share with us your thoughts or feelings about the content we present, you can do so in the comment section below, or by emailing us at weaponsandwarfare, all spelled out, at san.com. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off. Mm -hmm.